So as we continue our journey to the cross on the second Sunday of Lent, we hear another old, old story, the story of Abraham and Sarah. Now this one may be slightly less familiar than the story of Noah's Ark that we heard last week, but there are several important similarities between the two. Both are stories of God's relationship with humanity, and in each, God is portrayed as having a close and personal relationship with us. Very powerful and omnipresent, yet able to have the capacity to care for us as individuals. And in both stories, God takes the initiative and drives the action to create a new beginning for humanity. In the case of Noah, God decides to restart creation with Noah's descendants and the offspring of the animals and plants protected in the ark during the great flood. And God promises to Noah not to ever restart creation again. Whatever happens going forward, God won't give up on us. Even when we do things that make God angry or sad or even confused, causing God to question, what are these people doing to themselves and to the world? God is in this for the long haul. Now in the case of Abraham and Sarah, God is shaping God's people, giving birth to God's family. And God promises Abraham and Sarah to bless and walk with them and all of their future generations. Similar to the story of Noah's Ark, this particular story of Sarah and Abraham was likely written during the time of the Israelites' exile in Babylon. During the 6th century before Christ, the people of Israel were devastated by the destruction of their city and their temple. Their political, economic, and religious lives were thrown into chaos, and their leaders were exiled to Babylon leaving the people alone, feeling vulnerable, frightened, and abandoned. Now for generations, the people of Israel have been told stories of God's blessings and promises to them as people. They had a special place in God's heart. They had a bright future that God had in store for them. But given how things were going, they didn't feel particularly blessed or loved. It wouldn't have been surprising for them to begin to have doubts about their relationship with God. Did God still love them? Had God forgotten those promises? Perhaps God had forgotten them. Now the priestly writer responds to these questions and doubts by reminding them of the covenant that God made with Abraham and Sarah and how God's promises had been fulfilled. Although the journey took much longer than Abraham and Sarah expected, and they too had hard times and doubts along the way. Because you see that Abraham's relationship with God began 25 years before the story that we heard today. When Abraham was a young man of 75, God appeared to him, promising him that if Abraham packed up and moved his family to a new country that God would show him, God would make him a great nation, blessing him and all his descendants, and all of the people of the earth would be blessed through them. Now, Abram was a faithful follower of God, and this was a very motivating promise. So he does as God asks. Although it meant leaving behind his home, his homeland, the community, the life that he had spent 75 years building, for an uncertain future in an unknown location. Now, as you might suspect, things don't go nearly as so smoothly for Abram as he would have liked. Over the next 25 years, Abram encounters many obstacles on the path to acquiring the land that God has promised to give him and his family. But more importantly, more troublesome, he and Sarai remain childless, seriously calling into question how will they ever have the heirs that God promised? So our story today begins when Abram and Sarah are nearly 100 years old 
and it's been many years since God made those promises. Abram has seen a vision of the land that God has promised, but the reality is he and Sarah are still childless, and they are now very, very old. It would be reasonable for the hearers of this story to conclude that God's promise is not going to be fulfilled. Everyone knows 90-year-old women do not have babies. Abraham and Sarah had lived a good life, but it was unimaginable how they would become blessings to all the people of the earth if they had no one to carry on their name and legacy after they died. Had God forgotten Abraham and Sarah too? Of course not. God shows up. And not only does God show up, God confirms God's promise and swears that things really are about to change. Starting with the change in their names to align with the fulfillment of their divine purpose as mother and father to a multitude of nations. The names that Abram and Sarah have had for all those years fall away, and God gives them new names as a tangible reminder that through them, God is doing a new thing. Something that will transform the world as they have always known it. But then, God specifically promises that 90-year-old Sarah will give birth to Abraham's son. Now, according to the story, that last part seems so impossible that it made even Abraham and Sarah laugh, although they were careful to try not to let God know that they were laughing. <laughs> they had their doubts. But thankfully, any doubts that Abraham and Sarah had that seemed to have no impact on God's plan for them or the generations that followed. God was faithful to them and delivered on their promises, including the birth of Sarah's son Isaac, and on the promise to make Abraham and Sarah father and mother to a multitude of nations. Now when the people of Israel heard that story during the period of exile, they would have found it comforting. And more importantly though, it would have given them hope and the strength to continue to work to answer God's call, despite the seemingly hopelessness of their current situation. Their present reality would not be the end of their story. God had not abandoned them, nor reneged on the promise to make them a great nation. There was no need for them to doubt their relationship with God or that they were heirs to God's promise. However, they would need to have faith, because the fulfillment would come on God's time, not theirs. Thousands of years later, we continue to tell this story, because as followers of Christ, this is part of our story, part of our family history. We, too, are heirs to the everlasting covenant promises that God made to Abraham and Sarah. But the more time that passes, the more difficult it is to remember this promise and to keep believing in it. Like Abraham and Sarah and the Israelites in exile, we may begin to have doubts about God's presence and engagement in the world, in our everyday lives. If God was truly with us, wouldn't things be better people be happier, the world be safer? Wouldn't there be more justice and less oppression? But then we recall that God's promise isn't to fix everything for us. The covenant is to be our God, and we are to be God's people. And that means we have work to do in order to be the people that God calls us to be. Now we have a pretty good idea of what that work is that we need to do because God has told us through the prophets and through the person of Jesus. Our call can be summarized simply. Love God first with all our heart and mind and soul and love our neighbor as ourselves even if our neighbor doesn't seem to love us. Of course, the challenge is that although this sounds simple, it's really hard work. 
requiring us sometimes to do or say things that take us beyond our comfort zone, right. to think outside of the box, so that we can create a safe and comfortable place for others. Maybe requiring us to take a risk, having faith that God will see us through somehow if things don't turn out the way we planned. The good news, though, is that God is committed to walk with us, support us, and love us into the people that God has called us to be. Even if we're not always so sure how we feel about God. We can have doubts. We can lose faith. We can even be so angry that we turn our back on God. But God will never turn God's back on us. That's a promise that we can count on. Thanks be to God.